books and articles and things. But we are not able to give you everything we would like to give. You know, you need to be realistic. We are not here to impress anyone, just I can give you thousands of, uh, you know, literally thousands of sources that could be good for you. But in my case, it has taken oh, two decades to, to be familiar with that list of uh, things. And still working, you know, still finding new things to, to do. It's like, like uh, these two books I have here. First one is the Christology, an evangelical Christology by Bernard Run. He used to be, um, was among the neo-evangelicals uh, connected with Fuller, known on the, by the 70s, 80s, in the seminary of Fuller. Um, hopefully you remember what a neo-evangelical is as opposed to a fundamentalist. Uh, but this is, a, this is a good book, not that deep, not that shallow, uh, and it uh, deals with the basic topics of, uh, of a Christology, um, dealing with the historical Jesus, of course, which is something that you will have to deal with in any serious Christology nowadays something that we need to have an idea about. And one of you at least will deal with that as a presentation. Then it deals, of course, with Jesus' humanity, Jesus' divinity, uh, the possibility of the incarnation, dealing with canonic, canonic Christologies, and some other things related to contemporary Christologies, dealing with the councils, and a basic proposal coming from Bernard Ram, in this case, recent Christology or a rational for historic Christology. I would recommend this book for you to get a to get a panorama of and a solid panorama of the whole uh, area of Christology. Again, an evangelical Christology by Bernard Ram. The list of them. Okay, let's do it, and then we're going to have the same thing. I'm going to give you a little, uh, you know, introduction to the class, praying first, talking about these two books, and then we will go to the videos. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And after the videos, we will have some conversation about the content of those videos. This way. Okay. Um, you, um, yeah. Okay. Let's try, guys, and then uh, um, we'll we'll get to this. Father, I give you thanks again for this class. You know that I am really um, committed to talk with them and to communicate everything. I can about um, what I have been able to understand and, and able to know about your song in the scriptures and in other literature. And Father, I pray for them, for my students with me here in, in Chapel, and also for those as well, that you may give them the desire to get to know your son even more. Father, he is our everything. He is your revelation to us. He is our king, our savior. He is our future, Lord. We love them and we want to obey him too. Father, bless our class as we keep talking about him. Father, help us to be consistent that what we uh, say, what we talk about him is what we leave about him too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, class. So, once again, this is the first one that I want to recommend to you this, this time. 
the Christology by Bernard Ram, R A M M, an evangelical Christology, very good, succinct, uh, succinct book, and uh, panoramical in, in, you know, in most cases, but still very solid. The other book that I want to suggest is a very different one, it's a completely different one from the one I just, this is more recent. This is a collection of uh, essays and also some um, clips from other writings, uh, not only of Christians, but also from other religions. It's a panorama, again, coming from the early second century to our days, uh, including uh, other religions, like I said, there is a, there is a section on um, Judaism and Jesus, um, the Islam and Jesus, and then there is a whole section on the historical Jesus. Um, there's a section on the modern discussions about the possibility of, talk, of talking about God incarnate. Uh, it has been written and edited by David Ford, who is one of the major systematicians in Europe nowadays. Uh, he is also responsible, if you're familiar with him, with his books on contemporary theologians. So this is a book that is, I think, very useful because it gives you, in terms of short chapters, very short chapters, you can get a glimpse of uh, certain basic um, areas for discussing Jesus, not only within the Christian church, but also uh, within other religions, which is something that sometimes we don't we don't much deal with. We normally we don't we don't say you know we don't study how uh, the Islam deal with Jesus, and it's something that I think is vital for you in this context uh, about how to present Jesus to uh, Islamic theologian, for example, you know, or a Jewish theologian. Uh, very good in terms of sources. Again, uh, I know that you're a student, and so this is not one of those books that you want to, uh, you know, it's, it's one ex expensive book. You know, I don't know what, what it's, it's very expensive, so you can get it, it's a good one. But, you know, you, you may need to save on your Starbucks coffee instead of doing that. Amazing, if you, if you do uh, a lot of Starbucks coffee, you can't really spend a lot of money there. How much is a uh, Starbucks coffee? You know, $3? $3 or more? Daily? And there are people, there are students who do that. Incredible. How do you like that? How would Jesus respond to that? Oh my goodness, he would say, no, you better buy another good book of me. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and find, you know, the two videos that we have um, ready. Are we going to be able to listen to them here? Yes, one? so the idea is uh, we have John o Cho. Um, he's online right now, I'm trying to communicate through the text. We have his video. Mm -hmm. What we'll do is what we did before, we'll watch his video. And after that, we'll dedicate about 10 to 15 minutes for interaction with Dr. Alfaro. And after that interaction, we'll move uh, on to another video. Right. Okay. Let's start then with uh, the first one. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Juno Cho, and uh, the topic of my paper will be the Chronolo chronological geography of uh, Jesus' ministry. Um, first of all, I wanted to apologize. Uh, I am computer illiterate, and uh, I do realize that this presentation was supposed to be 20 minutes. However, um, the only program that I could find that I could use uh, where I could actually show you the map and kind of discuss the areas that uh, Jesus' uh, ministry was involved, but also show you my face at the same time, uh, has a recording time a limit of 15 minutes 
so that's also the reasons that I'm talking really fast and um, if I leave out some of the stuff that seems very important um, it's because I feel like I am a little bit rushed but I will try my best so my apologies there um, the as we were as I was studying um, some interesting things to know I guess just to know from the beginning um, if we look at this area, um, this is pretty much where Jesus' ministry involved. The Dead Sea is over here, the Sea of Galilee is over here to the north, and uh, his three tours, the Galilean ministry, uh, is involved to the left. Uh, this area where we have Cana there, Nazareth, Nain, Mount Tabor, Capernaum, um, and then he also when we when he also when he's down in the south doing his uh, Judean and Perean ministry. Uh, this is Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and Bethany. And of course, uh, there are a couple instances where we find him right here in the middle in Samaria, um, as well, and the Capolis to the uh, to the west. And also sometimes when he escaped uh, for respite to the to the northwest Tyre, and also Mount Hermon for the transfiguration to the north uh, east, and also Caesarea Philippi. Um, so uh, most have him his ministry uh, beginning with his baptism, and uh, if you take a look, uh, he started out with Nazareth, um, and then he traveled down south, and uh, depending on I guess. Um, who you read. Uh, some have him crossing the Jordan up here towards the north, some have him uh, crossing the Jordan down here to the south. But what is, uh, I think, uh, pretty much everybody agrees on that he most likely was baptized by uh, John the Baptist uh, right around this area. Um, and then after his baptism, uh, Jesus made his way back up north. Uh, but before he did that, of course, we know that he retreated to the Judean uh, wilderness. Um, so this area here uh, where he was there for 40 days and 40 nights and then afterwards he, he made his way back up to uh, Cana which is over here number number four um, this is where uh, the wedding of course where he performed his first miracle um, turning water into wine uh, and then uh, briefly um, before he started his uh, what we officially the, the Galilean tour of his ministry, uh, there's some he goes down back to Jerusalem, and this is the first recording of um, him going to Jerusalem for the Passover uh, after the start of his ministry, and uh, it's there when he's there he makes his way back after the Passover, uh, he meets the woman at the well it's Char this is number sixteen. Um, and then he goes to back to Cana, and this is where we have the recording of um, him uh, healing the royal official's son. And from there, he goes back to Nazareth. And then from Nazareth, this is where we have uh, Jesus beginning his ministry, the first Galilean tour. Uh, and depending on, I think, um, who you read, some have uh, Mark uh, being uh, rejected in Nazareth uh, in the what we consider the first tour of Galilee, and then having to move his um, uh, headquarters to Capernaum, to the north of the Sea of Galilee, right there. And, and then I think Matthew has him doing this during the second tour. Uh, so what's some interesting things that he did during the uh, first tour of Galilee? Um, uh, he uh, made his rounds um, towards the left here, and then when he was back in Capernaum, he... Um, after he was done teaching in Galilee, he uh, called for his disciples. Uh, we also know that he healed uh, a leopard, a uh, paralytic, uh, and a uh, paralytic. And then um, after his teachings uh, around Galilee and after his calling his disciples, he makes his way down to Jerusalem for what's the second recorded uh, Passover that he spends. And that pretty much comes to... Uh, and then this is where we also find him... Um, uh, healing the person beside the, the pool of um, uh, Bethesda and um, uh, and then which is when he returns to Capernaum of course and that's kind of pretty much the end of his first tour of uh, Galilee and then the second tour uh, what are some interesting notes um, Jesus preaching uh, in Peter's boat is also mentioned most likely right here in the Sea of Galilee uh, another thing that's mentioned is that um, while he was in Capernaum, he heals the uh, centurion's servant, and um, also he meets uh, John 
the Baptist disciples. He heals uh, Jerry's son, uh, and then he also um, sends out the disciples to start preaching towards the Galilee area. Uh, nine is here down here, number twelve in the corner. Um, this city is or town is uh, interest of notice because this is where uh, Jesus uh, raises the the dead son, I believe, the dead boy, um, and that can kind of concluded pretty much the second tour of Galilee. He makes another tour, the final tour of Galilee, and this is interesting because, of course, uh, this is when Jesus starts teaching in parables as he's making his way around here teaching uh, the Jews. Um, another thing is, and so, um, as I mentioned before, um, Matthew has him uh, rejected in Nazareth during around this time. Um, and it's around this time that the where things get kind of rough for him because he's going around preaching, he's going around um, in performing miracles, so the Jewish leaders are kind of getting upset, and so uh, he hears about also about John the Baptist getting beheaded by Herod Antipas, and uh, so he has to retreat, and so he leaves this area of Galilee because this is Herod's territory, and he goes over the over the river. And he goes to Bethesda, uh, this area, and so because this is out of his reach, uh, Herod's reach, and this is also where um, we have him um, walking on water, feeding the five thousand, and he's talking about how he's the bread of life. And unfortunately, in John uh, chapter six, we also have him um, losing a lot of disciples around this time. Uh, I think a lot of pressure, maybe him not uh, being who they thought he would be, and so around with all this political pressure and. This being his final tour of Galilee, um, we have him uh, retreating um, tor towards the northeast, towards Tyre, um, and that kind of brings to a close the uh, his third Galilean tour. Um, and so this is kind of where, like, where we talk about how his uh, ministry begins to the Gentiles, um, because while he's in this northeast region, Tyre, uh, he uh, he meets the uh, the Canaanite woman. Um, and then from there, he's making his way towards south, east, towards uh, Decapolis, the Ten Cities. Um, and this is where he's also preaching to the Gentiles in this area. Um, some have recorded that, uh, you know, we, they think that he brought a lot of people uh, from the north when he was in Tyre as he's made, with, as he, uh, made his way towards the south. And so they have him, um, you know, so where do all these people, you know, these people that he needs to feed because this is also where the second time he performs, performs a miracle and he feeds the 4,000 and so uh, some people have him that those people followed him all the way from up here which is this is a pretty long way actually um, and then um, after Decapolis after preaching and teaching Decapolis he moves towards uh, five there's a, there isn't a name there but I think that's the harbor the Dalmuta um, this is where um, the, uh, the the Jewish leaders they ask him for a sign. Hey, you know, if you're the Messiah, if you're God, hey, show us a sign. And then after that, when he retreats to Bethesda again, he takes the boat and crosses the Sea of Galilee, goes to Bethesda. Um, he does another healing there, um, and then he retreats. I mean, well, he takes his disciples and he goes all the way up north to Caesarea Philippi where he's also preaching to the Gentiles but this is also where he um, is telling his disciples of the, the things that are supposed to happen, the things that are supposed to come um, and so and he talks about the church and, and this is where Peter rebukes him saying you're not gonna die and this is where um, Jesus says you know hey Satan get behind me and after that um, event in the Caesarea Philippi Jesus makes his way up north to Mount Hermon and of course this is where the uh, transfiguration happens and after the transfiguration he makes his way back down to Capernaum his headquarters down here the north of the Sea of Galilee and um, uh, this is also where we have the the, the, um, uh, the Peter and him we have to fish the tax money coming out of the fish that's where this, this is happening uh, and then he leaves uh, for him and his disciples leave for Jerusalem for the final time um, for the third Passover and uh, along the way um, as you can see this is Samaria down here uh, and then this is Judea so we know that they are not welcome in Samaria and so they're walking along the border 
and this is where uh, they come across the ten leopards who um, Jesus heals uh, this is also where Jesus sends out the 70 disciples and uh, he enters uh, Jerusalem um, not for the final time but he enters for the uh, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles and um, there this is where he also is confronted again by the Jewish leaders and so he leaves uh, this area this, this area where for the safe area of Perea and um, he's while he's in Perea this area right here uh, Bethany back towards Jerusalem to the left this is where Lazarus uh, Mary and Martha live and this is when Lazarus dies and uh, they're calling for him and this is like a two-day journey where Jesus uh, comes and uh, comes to heal him and that's probably the you know the final straw on the camel's back where now they decided we're gonna kill Jesus um, and so from there having hearing what's gonna happen Jesus makes his way back to Perea Ephraim I think the city of Ephraim is right around here um, and this is where he meets the rich young ruler uh, and then either uh, at Jericho number 17 along the way there uh, or along the way towards back to Bethany um, this is where um, James and John uh, you know the mother asked hey can they be you know, on their on his right and left uh, this is also a longer journey where they meet um, Zacchaeus um, and they, this is where also they meet heal he heals the the blind beggar um, and then he finally makes his way to Bethany uh, 21 there uh, for for a gathering at Mary and Martha's house and this is also where Mary um, anoints him with oil for his burial and after that uh, Jesus leaves for Jerusalem uh, I haven't really gotten a map because um, I didn't know if I didn't have enough time to mention it but of course um, then there's a de detailed uh, map of his journey you know the places that he went to as he was uh, taken from you know from Hera to you know the Pontius uh, Pilate and uh, Gavolta and all these uh, different places that he went to um, so as we as I was studying and learning more about the historiography uh, there's a lot a lot of things to consider um, so what does of course Jesus you know he uh, he was there from the beginning and so his travels and they all must have some sort of meaning um, why did he do what he did at these places um, I think uh, there are books on uh, some people discussing Matthew's uh, take, some people discussing Mark's take and the significance of it. I think there's a new book out called uh, Along the Road that talks about um, the different uh, places that Jesus visited, like Sachar, um, and the different div the divine titles that where Jesus first speaks that he is the Messiah, he is this, and so what's the significance there? Um, and there's also so there's a lot of uh, meat to uh, to figure out and to discuss and um, just as um, you know when Elijah was following on Elijah each of the four stops that they made there was a theological uh, significance to those, the names of those places and why they did the way why they stopped at Sachar and the Jordan River and uh, Girgal I think and uh, Jericho was the other place and so there are uh, very a lot of things to discuss and also um, is there significance to you know did J Jesus know or I mean you know him being God uh, where and how he was going to be taken around during that final week those uh, last few days you know around Jerusalem around the temple and so but uh, in a nutshell this is my uh, brief uh, introduction to my time much walking guys we don't need a lot of exercise extra huh? <clears throat> 
Vamos al otro. Si me da ¿Y ¿Quieres o podemos? We can talk. Sí. Guys, can, can we talk about what we just saw? Any uh, reaction to what you just see about Jesus going around? You know, it's interesting that most of the places, more, most of the events that take place in the Gospels um, are, um, you know, scholars struggle to fit them in the, the whole picture there. There's no, you know, of course, there are certain events that are given names and cities and where is it exactly, but there are others that are not very uh, clearly where they took place. Um, three years or only one. You know, it's interesting that only John, you should be aware of this, only John is the one who tell us that there were three um, Passovers and the synoptics just mentioned one. So some scholars now they believe that it's his Possible that the ministry of Jesus was only one year? You know, there's only one Passover mentioned in Matthew and Mark and Luke. But there's a lot. If that's the case, there's so much to, you know, be put inside that one year. Um, so what else is is something that you would need to bring to the to this uh, geography of Jesus. Why is it that he had to choose the countryside for most of his ministry? The countryside, the north, almost nothing to the south. Is there any reason for that or? It was the political center, the religious center of Jerusalem was not uh, very friendly. It was a pretty hostile area. Uh, I would expect that him coming as he did that he was the Messiah and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests all them not particularly caring for that idea. Right. It was right. safer for him to be preaching out in the country more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would that mean that he is not willing to engage for long scholars? You know, because, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, we think about in Jerusalem, they more needs, you know, because the people really struggle, you know, you know, and they really do it pretty bad. So he walk around and then he came for a little bit and then, then again, came again. That was kind of interesting, you know, how right. he tried to uh, what he come into Jerusalem and try to uh, be minister there for a little bit. They got some discussions mm -hmm. and then he left. Uh, then he could do it back and forth. I don't know. Right. Every time he engaged with the scholars, he left them wondering more than they left. Right. He would leave them with a question that they would have struggle to answer. Right. I, I don't know if he was like a, he don't want to like a really get into a really, really big fight in the day. He's kind of aware to be carefully how they came out. Right, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, Pharisees were all over. They, they didn't have Jerusalem as their only place of residence. They, there were Pharisees all over the area. Sadducees were more located in Jerusalem. Um, the Pharisees, by the way, have been compared to the movement of Jesus. And some scholars believe that the reason why he focused so much on the Pharisees is because how much they look alike to the Christian movement. So that should be something to think whenever you're criticizing the Pharisees. You know? It's not that easy. It's not that he... he hated them, you know, that could it be possible that in this case, the so famous, at least in a Spanish saying that, you know, what you hate most in your enemy is what you reflect 
or your temptation, you're tempted to repeat yourself? You know, why is it that he concentrates so much on the Pharisees, all the areas, instead of the Sadducees? Because there's a similarity with him more than what he has with the Sadducees. The Sadducees were, if you remember, if you were to bring them here to this scene, who were they? Who were theologically speaking? Okay? In the Pharisees? Fundamentalists? Calvinists. Calvinists. <laughs> right. He's doing this heavy on them. Yeah. In um, the last section here, where it deals with Jesus' crucifixion, it's interesting that seems to be that the Pharisees are not, and there's many scholars, you know, that go in this direction. The Pharisees don't seem to be very much involved in the crucifixion. There seems to be more Sadducees involved, uh, which is something interesting if they are the liberals, if they are the one holding the power at the time, you know, the connection with power in Jerusalem. Um, and it could be something related to why Jesus didn't want to spend that much time in Jerusalem as he spent in the other areas you know, of, of Palestine. If you think about it, when Paul was brought before the, the uh, council in Jerusalem, he pitted the Sadducees against the Pharisees <laughs> in his defense. Right. I like that pretty nicely with what you were saying, Paul. Right. And just may I say something quickly, and based on what you said, um, and what Dr. Alfarius mentioned, they were so close to um, orthodoxy in their doctrine. I mean, they held to uh, to life after death. They understood that there was angelic um, life, uh, which the, the Sadducees denied. And the Lord confronts them with that. So the idea of they're so close to the truth and yet so far, uh, you know, and so the Lord confronted them uh, fully in that regard. Right, right. I think it was, it might have been um, uh, Buck who mentioned at one point, um, I don't know if there is complete certain certainty on this, but the high priest or the uh, the most important priest at that point was Sadducee. Yeah, they were Sadducees. Uh, then you had 71 elders being part of the Sanhedrin, which were, you know, the Sanhedrin was conform of both Sadducees and right. Pharisees. So. Right. Yeah, he did. He did a good job in, you know, doing that um, description there. There's so much, but again, it's it's interesting to check that most of the events are located by scholars, not with certainty, in those places. You know, you need to you need to use some type of uh, imagination to put most events. Uh, within those three years of ministry of Jesus. He walked a lot, though. You know, I don't know. You would need, guys, if, if you haven't been in uh, uh, Israel once, it would be good for you to go. You know, I was one of those who, uh, you know, I didn't want to go. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, I have the millennium in the future. I will go there then, you know. But honestly, it helped you to to feel the you know the area and check Capernaum, for example, how big the city was, how close to the sea was, how is the shore of uh, of Capernaum connected with the and imagine Jesus there. It gives you uh, something that is difficult to explain, but it, it, it helps you connect. With the, with the life of our Lord there. You know, it's like preaching. I had the opportunity of preaching in a boat in the Sea of uh, Galilee. And imagine Jesus doing it. I did it on, on the day, though. You know, I didn't do it on, on a, during a storm or something like that. Because I don't have the power to steal the storm. And so <laughs> it, is, it is important, I think, just to get to know the place. 
as, uh, as much as possible, Jericho, uh, Nazareth, uh, the sea, you know, the, the, the Dead Sea and the Galilean Sea, the Jordan, um, the other cities, you know, again, Capernaum is important because Capernaum is the place where Jesus, is Jesus' home as a grown-up. He, uh, he, uh, he was uh, in Nazareth after a certain time, and then he moved to Capernaum. It's interesting that most of these maps don't uh, put the big city of Sephoris. You know, have you heard about Sephoris, guy? Sephoris. That's supposed to be very close to Nazareth. You know, uh, they say it was about 10 miles uh, east, northeast of Nazareth, a big city, Greek city, Roman Greek city, where Jesus was supposed to work during his uh, uh, infancy, during his, uh, you know, children years, and, and also helping his, his so-called fa father, Joseph, building uh, the city. He worked in the construction there. Most, uh, most possible. Tecton means uh, construction. I told you that already several times. So that means working in building uh, with wood and stone and uh, how do you call uh, that type of work, guys? When you work with cement and, and masonry, exactly that type of thing. And Jesus was most of the time. Historian says. It is very possible that they travel every day from Nazareth to Sepphoris to go there, work the whole day there, and go back in the afternoon to Nazareth doing that. I can relate to that. You know, in El Salvador, I used to do something similar. And 10 kilometers or so to go to a place, work, and go back. Of course, I didn't walk. <laughs> All right. Can we see the other... Yes, sir. Do we have enough time for that? Just, have, just a quick question that I think would be relevant to this. When we were reading uh, on the class, and we were all reading on Stein, Stein explains that both Mark um, and I think uh, specifically Mark uh, frames the whole gospel mm -hmm. in a geographical way, yeah. but not necessarily chronologically yeah. speaking. Right. So he just centers on events that took place right. in northern part, and then said, you know, events that took place in Jerusalem or in Judea. Right. And then uh, Luke does something similar that is thematic, and only John is the one that um, that recalls more than one pass off. But that's why they're able to at least extend his his, his ministry to at least three years, right? Uh, based on on the accounts of John, and yet John is also very much centered on a schematic uh, framework. So I was just looking at our, our brother, the way he did his presentation, and in any attempt that we make to do a chronological uh, scheme, uh, we, would, we, we, we couldn't really uh, nail it down. I mean, that's, that's, is that, is that that's right? what I'm talking about when I say that you have to guess. There is a lot of guessing in terms of precisely when was this event taking place, you know, because of that. There seems to be that the Gospels, the, the four of them, are not that interested in terms of placing all the events in chronological order the way we would do it today. Uh, they are more interested in ordering the events thematically. Uh, one of them does it in you know following one theme the other does it in another order of course apart from the basic events you know birth baptism uh and death but between those two major things there's a big discussion about the chronology you know how you put together the whole thing is it true that jesus went three times there what, you know, could be more, and the gospel doesn't give us that information. Um, could be that he visited certain other 
parts that are not mentioned there. We don't know. Uh -huh. John says the Paul thing that he said at the beginning were written even then. Right. Right. And we were, we were talking the other day. Probably we won't have time for the next video, my friend. It's, it's about um, the thing is that, uh, you know, you can see that in the cleansing of the temple with John and the synoptics. Uh, I, I told you, I think, that it's, it's problematic if you want to make it, because there are some scholars who have tried to make it chronologically, you know, by force. So what do you do with the cleansing of the temple? Was it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry or was it at the end? Because, well, yeah, exactly. That's what some will tell you. But then you get in trouble because, you know, if, if there was two times where Jesus did this, why is it that none of them, none of the Gospels tell us there was two times? John doesn't, doesn't tell us, you know. And so it may, it may be that the best explanation is that every gospel writer is following a thematic theological um, uh, structure. And because of that, they feel, they feel free to order those, those events in terms of that. Um, the same can be said about the... the uh, the Sermon of the Mountain. You know, you will find Jesus in Matthew doing it, the Sermon of the Mountain, very early. Chapter 5. Where do you find it in, in Luke? Well, first of all, there's no mountain sermon. Sermon Mountain. How do you say that? Mount, Mount, sermon of the Mount, whatever. Uh, sermon of the Mount there. In Luke, there's no mount where he teaches that. And of course, the explanation has to do again with the content of the sermon doesn't have to be seen as something that took place only once. You know, Jesus may have said the content of the sermon in different occasions. And so in Luke, seems to be more the Sermon of the Bali because it takes place, you know, close to... Luke 9, something like there. But it's, it's a Bali where he is, you know, teaching. And so, again, it's, it's the a structure that we find in every gospel writer. There's other things very interesting to notice in the, in the gospels. You know, John spent all his gospels telling us about Jesus long lectures, uh, connecting those lectures most of the time with Jewish festivals. You know, he is, con Jesus is connected and is the fulfillment of the Jewish festivals. The tabernacle, the trumpets, you know, the Passover, it's Jesus is connected with those and also with main themes related to it, the identity of God in Jesus. I am the good pastor, you know, the good pastor long lectures of Jesus, uh, not one single short parable. And yet, the three synoptics tell us that Jesus did not teach without that type of parable. That's a big difference. That's why some scholars, you know, tend to put uh, John apart and tell us that John is later, probably close to the 90s when it was written, while the other Gospels were earlier, because of the way of, uh, according to them, the way the synoptics are reading reflects more primitive, you know, uh, style of writing, which is an interesting observation, again, that we need to be um, aware of. It's not, it's not easy to put together the two things. Where is it that Jesus said that the lecture on, on the Sermon of the Mount in the context of, of John? Or the other way around, you know, the good pastor, the good shepherd in the synoptics. Where was it? It's not, it's not easy. Um, there are five sermons, important sermons in Matthew. The whole material seems to be organized 
in terms of those five sermons in Matthew. Um, in um, I have more information on that on my on my PowerPoint. If you, I have it ready. Can you can you yes, sir. show it there? Something um, I wanted to mention just of what you just said that I think is important is that um, historians have have also mentioned the fact that male Jewish people during the time of the first century and on during that period of time, the male will usually um, do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem at least three times a year. It was almost mandatory. So they would go to Passover with the families, but they would also be there on Shavuot, which was the Feast of uh, Pentecost, mm. and on the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's interesting, because after all, which is the feasts that you find in John chapter 7, uh, the account of the last day of the feast, when he stands up and he says, whoever thirsts, come to me, and I will give you to drink living water. There was an interesting uh, connection with the last day of the, of the feast. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles lasted for seven days. And on the eighth day, seventh day, the last day, they would have something called the water, water libation ceremony in the temple. Mm. And it was a ceremony that right. uh, included the terminology of living water mm -hmm. in the celebration of the temple. And he draws attention to himself on that last day of the feast, and it says, I will give you the true living water. Right, right. It's really awesome. That connection is, is important to see. You have it there? Yeah. You're ready. And you, so gospel Christologies, they are different, but not necessarily uh, in contradiction. That's the, that's the um, opinion of liberals. You know, their con contradiction or contradictory, or how do you say, con contradictory. Um, and because of that, uh, methodologically speaking, they suggest that we should do something similar when dealing with Jesus. You can, you know, some liberals nowadays will tell you, you see, what you find here in the Gospels is a way of dealing with certain events, but with the freedom of moving around and sometimes supplementing and sometimes even uh, making things up to uh, address the need of the uh, people of the congregation. Is that true? Is that what happens here? Or can you still find place for uh, a har harmonization of the four Gospels? And there's still enough space for finding harmony within the four Gospels. Harmony? That takes for granted that the writers are not trying to present us with a chronological, precise, scientific way of picturing Jesus. They are arranging their material according to certain topics. That's why you have um, you have the differences there. Okay. Let me go first then to the first one here. The first, uh, go ahead. Uh, let me show you. Here's the comparison of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Check, check the difference here. Matthew has first the infancy, and then he has five main sermons of Jesus, uh, around which the whole material is organized. The Sermon of the Mount. Then, you know, the famous 13, chapter 13 is the parables of the kingdom. Then you have, the, of course, the, the uh, future, uh, the sermon related to the future and the second coming. And then, of course, the passion narrative. Mark seems to be a little bit more simple. Uh, it's divided in two main sections here. One main topic of Mark is the Son of Man as the um, righteous sufferer, the one who is being developed throughout the whole thing. But again, you can see easily here, and I'll, I'll talk about that later on when we come to evaluate or mention some of the things of, 
old, old liberalism that they prefer Marx because of this simplicity. They divided the whole thing in two half, and then finding that the first, the first half uh, of Jesus' Mark is someone who is um, apparently believing that something is going to take place, and that something doesn't take place. And something happens here, just at the middle, in chapter 8. You know, it's like a crisis, so they said. You know, and some liberation theologians still believe that. That's why it's important for us to know this old theory. You know, the, the liberals in the 19th century used to use this type of analysis. They prefer Marx because of its simplicity. And later on, they will learn that that's, that, simplicity, that simplicity is only apparent, so it's only superficial because there's a lot of theology also here. But according to the liberals and some liberation theologians, this first half presents a Jesus that is uh, working his way with an idea of God, with an idea of the kingdom of God that is uh, coming soon, that it will come from outside, that you have to prepare the world for this coming of the kingdom, apocalyptic kingdom. And so multitudes come around him. There's a lot of miracles that he performed in the midst, and suddenly in chapter 8, something changes. Because he comes to the realization that something is not quite right, the way he has been presented. This is Jesus, according to them. Jesus suffers a Galilean crisis, you know, and they talk about this type of Jesus of going to the desert and going, going along. And in that type of uh, uh, situations, Jesus comes, to a crisis of identity. Jesus comes to this crisis of identity and then he comes back to his disciples and start the, the second half of Mark. And now, instead of having a lot of people around him, he concentrates on his disciples. There's not a lot of miracles. The proclaiming of the gospel of the kingdom of God is no longer one that preaches the kingdom coming from outside. It's something that has to come through his death. And then, um, of course, there's a lot of methodological issues that are not quite right. And the liberals will learn that the hard way at the beginning of the 20th century with another uh, school, a, a liberal school, that will tell them, you know, you fail to get the idea of Mark uh, concerning Jesus. There is no such a thing as a Galilean crisis here. Can you, the only way you can find a Galilean crisis here is by trying to place or put into Jesus' um, mind, trying to read into Jesus' mind your own ideas of the time. That's an interesting thing that has applications for all of us when preaching the Gospels, friends. We have the temptation of reading the psychology of Jesus uh, oftentimes. You know, reading into the psychology of what would Jesus think, for example, that common and famous question. Well, our answer should be very simple. We just don't know if the Bible doesn't say it. You know? Because there's a big risk here. Liberals will tell you when reading Mark, well, that's, this is normal. This is what would take place in a normal human being. But hello, you're not dealing here with a, a normal human being. You know, you need to read the mind of Jesus. That's one of the most difficult things, even with normal people. Reading intentions. Reading, uh, you know, the feelings inside. By the way, this is something very important that the historical Jesus discussion has taught us recently. When dealing with the historical Jesus, avoid dealing with intentions, avoid dealing with psychological moods, because that's some of the things that are more difficult to get. And of course, there's a point where you need to do that in history and in other areas of human thought. But when dealing with Jesus, you have to be extremely careful. 
because most of the time our mistakes come from trying to read into Jesus' mind what we already know. So just read the gospel. See if the gospel tells us that there was a crisis. You know, check if there is a reason for Jesus changing or if there was a change at the end of the day. In the case of Luke, Luke organizes his gospel in different ways. You know, again, here comes the discussion of Q. But you remember my, what is Q at the end? You, you remember what I told you, mentioned some classes ago, maybe it wasn't here or, you know, I have so many classes. That sometimes I miss, where was it that I said it? Yes, sir. It's like this, what they say is the shared source that Matthew and Luke use written sometimes maybe similar to Mark. Right. But that we don't have. Right. Right. Well, Q, what is it? Why Q? German word. Okay, meaning what? Source. Okay. Q is, is uh, supposedly it's a document of which there is no document. Of course, there's no manuscript of it. But we need to be honest with this. Most scholars will tell you that uh, it is uh, something basic and something so firm that most scholars will use it to analyze the gospel. There are still some who completely don't believe in the existence of Q, but in general, most scholars, I would say, would uh, uh, agree that there is some, some kind of material there even if it's not a manuscript yes sir sexual assault <laughs> there was not no evidence for it <laughs> my goodness um so when you're reading when you're reading matthew and when you're reading luke you discover there are sections in the two gospels you're reading matthew and you're reading luke you discovered that there are sections where they look very similar, and you go back to Mark, and you find uh, that those sections that are here and here are repeated almost Xerox copy, you know, in Mark, right? So th that's what they say, and that's what they observe. There are sections in Luke and Matthew that are clearly taken from Mark. So they say, you know, sections that are very in the same order, the same terminology, very similar here and here, uh, that are here. But you keep reading this and you keep reading this, and then you find that there is something that you find very similar here and very similar here, like both are connected, but you go back here and it's not here. And that material is what is Q. You get it? And so most of the time, this Q thing has to do with sayings of Jesus, um, wisdom sayings. You know, uh, those um, sayings of Jesus, that, like the ones that show up in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, short uh, Wisdom sayings, what's the word they use for this uh, technical word that they you know, use for describing what Q is? There is nothing of the passion of Jesus in Q. There's nothing of the infancy in Q. Most of it, Q has to do with those saying. This is important for you to remember because the Jesus Seminar is still very powerful in, in the U.S., tell us that the real Jesus was the Jesus of Q, because he's previous to the gospel. And the Jesus of Q is, you know, those communities that kept alive, either by writing or by uh, oral communication, the content of Q, didn't include anything related to the passion of Jesus, the death and resurrection, meaning for them that the original community didn't care much about the death and resurrection of Jesus. They just care about the wisdom sayings of Jesus. And that's why they kept it, you know, as part of the tradition. And so, by the, the Jesus Seminar will tell you, the earliest Jesus 
was uh, similar to a cynic philosopher who was, you know, walking, you know, like cynics did. Of course, there were several differences according to them too. But the main thing that Jesus was doing in his ministry was saying this type of sayings, wisdom sayings, you know, short uh, apotekmas, you know, those sayings that were short. And so Jesus is actually at the end of the day for the Jesus seminar, a wisdom sayer, you know, a wisdom philosopher. That's the main, one of the main discussions, whether if this is true, then we have problems. Because if the earliest of the um, congregations or Christian communi communities didn't care much for the resurrection and, and death of Jesus, then the most important is only the saints. And that's what we need to keep alive, so they say. That's why historians, good historians, need to deal with this. How would you respond to that before leaving? That's yeah, the time is, oh, we still, we still have five more minutes. We've got people who don't want to believe in the biblical Jesus telling us to believe in a, in a source that doesn't exist. Right. So they can prove that the Jesus that's in the source that doesn't exist. Yeah, right. Of course, you know, there's uh, what, I, what I have uh, you know, explained here is a very simple way of putting the whole thing. There is, there is a, a, you know, a whole uh, movement of experts uh, dealing with the nature of Q, even finding stages in the history of Q. Uh, changing from community to community, you can go to the library and check the the history of Q, for example. You will find that every stage in the history of this supposedly document or oral content, according to some of these experts, uh, go through different stages in different communities. At least you need to be aware of that. That's something that needs to be brought to the discussion whenever you're talking about gospel, gospel uh, Christologies. Yes. Doesn't this present to us the challenge and yet the caution that we have to have when we're trying to pinpoint the historical Jesus? In the sense that um, something that you briefly mentioned, but each of these writers had a presupposition when they presented their gospel. They weren't just simply writing a record of events. Right. And so there's things that, you know, one maybe doesn't reference that another does. Or in some cases, we read that one further expounds yeah. on an event. But that's because it's usually the same that they've expounded on or that they've included. Right. That helps interpret the meaning. But that's because it fits within to their presupposition, their story, their, their theme that they yeah. present us. Right. That it seems like. The, the search for the historical Jesus is more of a, a, an attempt to prove that he, he existed. And at the same time, what they miss then is that there's a theme that's being presented. Right. Because if we're not careful, I mean, that, that's where with the Gospel of Thomas, you get sayings of Jesus. But they get within the large narrative of right. the description right. of who Jesus claims to be and, what, you know, what we have. But right. Of Jesus that are very wisdom oriented, and right? Well, and that's that's part of the the whole discussion too. You know, that's the reason why the same scholars who favor the Gospel of Thomas, which consists of this type of sayings, will tell you, well, the Gospel of Thomas may be earlier than you know most of the time it's supposed. It's, it's not second century, uh, according to them. Most of them will tell you it, it could be even earlier than the Gospels that we have here. Why? Why do you know? How do you know that? Well, it's very similar to Q. You see, you see. Uh, um, but the thing here, here's the thing, guys. We, the history of uh, Christology, especially since the Enlightenment, uh, for those of us who want to be faithful to the Scriptures on the one hand, and who want to maintain that Christology and Christianity. It's not about ideas only, like other religions. Is that we need to understand that there is need for historical 
uh, research about the person of Jesus, and that cannot be abandoned or given up to secular historians who could do this. They're, they're supposed to be good historians that use the same tools of history to come up and to produce uh, good, solid evidence for the reality of Jesus in context. Because uh, uh, that's one of the areas that we need to care, take care without neglecting that other area. Because, you know, if you go only to the extreme of history and leave all this discussion to the Jesus Seminar, for example, or secular historians that don't care much about this, they come up with a distorted Jesus like this and completely different. And we will, we will talk a little when, you know, there's a, at least a presentation on the historical Jesus here um, that is completely different from the one that is presented by this, uh, a scripture. But the other extreme, however, is to completely forget about the historical Jesus and say, like Bookman would say, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, that the historical Jesus is not actually something that we should be interested in because what is important is the charisma, the proclamation that make changes. And here we have a Lutheran, uh, German uh, historian, uh, you know, existentialist New Testament scholar dealing with the problem of the historical Jesus and saying the church is not supposed to pay attention to the historical Jesus because what we care is the message of the New Testament. And so we have the other extreme here. And, and so we have uh, someone who instead of having a Christology in his New Testament theology book, for example, he wrote several, uh, many books, of course. He wrote uh, a book on the history of the um, uh, synoptic tradition, how the gospel were built up, how they were uh, composed. And according to his understanding, there is no way for us to go beyond what the community wrote. There's no way for you, for us, to go to the historical Jesus because everything we have is what the community has written. And we are supposed to be content with that. And so we can explore the historical situation of the early Christian community and come up with reasons why they kept this saying of Jesus alive. But from that, to say that this is exactly how Jesus was, there is no connection for him. You see? And so for the first um, four or five decades of the 20th century, Bultmanism uh, dominated the whole century. The saying no to the historical Jesus. The historical Jesus is not important. See, that will change also just right by the, the 50s and 20th century. And a lot of people, a lot of uh, scholars will tell you that is very similar to Gnosticism. That is very similar to, hey guys, have you, have you heard me already saying that the worst enemy of the Christian church is Gnosticism in different areas, beginning with Athanasius and even before Athanasius uh, in Arianism because Gnosticism is is even present nowadays in the movement of, uh, you know, transgender thing and um, the idea that, that you can separate, split your mind from your body, for example. And your body is not connected with, you know, you, the mind is something completely apart from the body. And the body is just something, you know, secondary. And that idea of the physicality, the history, the historicism, the, the historic nature of the Christian faith in the person of uh, a Nazarene 2,000 years ago is basic for Christian faith. And we need to deal with that person, even if the sources are not, um, uh, 
you know, sources like histories, uh, as we found history nowadays, they are history, of course, but the way they present the information has uh, a different uh, approach most of the time that uh, just simply a historian telling us without, you know, commitment to what he is telling us. So again, it's about keeping the middle. Yes, the historical Jesus is important, right? We need to deal unless you want to leave it to those who come up with weird answers. And you don't want to go oh, completely to the extreme of Bookman, where it says, well, what, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a trick, and that's a, a, a threat. It's also a danger there, because it's so easy for, no, what is important is the word of God. What is important is the scripture, the message of the scripture. And then you are in trouble. Because then you are very close to be a Mormon. You know why? The Mormon, you know, says many things about Jesus being here in the States. You know that, of course. Doing a lot of things in the States for which there is no historical evidence whatsoever. So Christianity is not like that. You have to keep in the middle here. And that's where uh, good historians, Christian historians are needed. And uh, probably one of you would be the next one. All right? What's a good alternative though, to Alfaro to study this, taking into account that you have a millennial tendency to um, just emphasize uh, existentialism, but it strips uh, his teaching from the miracles of Christ, from the reality of the resurrection. And then you go back to the historical Jesus, and they do something similar on that regard. Right. And they center on the humanity and not in the deeds, specifically on the resurrection and, and the, re the redemptive act of Christ. So uh, there's, his message is very much connected to his deeds in order to accomplish salvation and redemption. Right, right. So a more holistic would be the alternative. And I think, uh, you know, there are several historians, you know, the, the, the history, the Jesus of history controversy has gone through different stages so far. The first search for the historical Jesus, the second after, uh, you know, there was this first search for the historical Jesus, centuries 18, 19. Then there's a time where no historical Jesus, both men, Bart, even to a point, a certain, a certain extent. Then it comes the second search for the historical Jesus. Uh, the Bolmanians, disciples of Boltman, will tell, his, will tell their, their master, their professor, you're wrong, sir. Sorry. We're not able to follow you in this. And Boltman is there, you know, I'll say, I'm going to tell you more about this later on. Uh, but after a while, that's in the 50s, uh, for a decade or so, the Boltmanians tried to look for the historical Jesus again as something important for Christian theology. And by the 70s, middle 70s, that movement is decaying again because there's a lot of criticism on the philosophical insight that they are putting into the historical Jesus that they are discovering. After the second search for the historical Jesus, there is a third search of the historical Jesus. And there's a big variety within that search. And to write is one of the biggest, but also croissant in the Jesus uh, seminar. There are two extremes there. And of course, you need to be immersed in order to understand all the details here. I find in several of these other more conservative uh, scholars, and to your right, uh, of course, Ben Betherington, Evans, by the way, Craig Evans, uh, there's, there's a big amount of great scholars dealing with the historical Jesus in a more holistic way. What this means is, is complicated to explain, but I think we will have a little bit more time to give you more 
uh, information on that later on. Oops. Come on, guys. You tell me. Time, 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 time. <laughs> Five more minutes, okay, and then that's it. God bless you guys. <laughs>